and his hat and his cane by his side. And from a little bit later period on the left of your screen, uh, Mr. Ruskin's calling card. So without further ado, we'll get started here. I'm going to do things um, pretty much in chronological order. Uh, I just thought I would show you quickly the very first Ruskin first edition that uh, I ever bought many years ago. The Political Economy of Art published in 1857, later called A Joy Forever. Um, my principles with um, collecting books are, first of all, with Ruskin to collect if possible first editions. I like the book to be in original condition and the best possible condition that you can buy it in. I like the book to be complete. Uh, later books might have a dust wrapper. Uh, tipped in slips should be there. Errata slips should be there. Anything that was issued with the book should be there. Uh, if, however, um, a first edition was unobtainable or too expensive, I had to settle for a second edition. Uh, you'll see here that in most of these pictures, there is a ruler. I, I tried to photograph the book with a ruler. So it's a 12 inch ruler. You can tell roughly the size of the book uh, by checking out the ruler. I'd like to start with uh, a little run of books called Friendship's Offering. These, uh, this particular run runs from 1835 to 1840. When uh, Ruskin was a young man, he was interested in poetry, although his first printed works before this time were essays and uh, short contributions to periodicals like the Architectural Magazine. But he was really interested in poetry. His father, uh, encouraged him in his, po in his poetry. His father would have been quite happy if he had entered a career as a poet and become a poet laureate. His mother would have rather he entered the church and become Archbishop of Canterbury. But nevertheless, he devoted himself to poetry and he became known as one of the most popular album poets of the day. So these little books published uh, around Christmas time, I take it, each year, contain some of Ruskin's poetry, his poetry. Um, they also contained some prose items, and one of the prose items that uh, appeared in these annuals, it's in uh, this volume here, if you can follow my cursor, is a prose piece called Leone. And it was printed first by itself in, in this book. However, approximately uh, in 1868, supposedly, a pamphlet form was published of this particular poem, 16 pages long in this small, fragile looking pamphlet, Leone, A Legend of Italy by J.R. However, um, this uh, book was really published in 1890. It was fabricated by the great forger, Thomas James Wise, who lived from 1859 to, 1930, to 1937. Uh, he possessed perhaps the greatest private library of English literature at the end of the 19th century. Um, this wasn't enough for him, however. He uh, fostered connections with famous authors or their associates or their family, which helped him obtain exceptional copies of many of the, the works published by these authors. He even tackled William Morris and, and uh, Charles Dickens. He preyed upon authors who were either deceased, they tended to be deceased, or who were incapacitated, as Ruskin was, in 1890. And so the uh, authors themselves couldn't really get involved in saying whether these books were uh, real or fabricated. Uh, we've probably all consulted Thomas James Wise's bibliography of Ruskin. Uh, it was published in 18 parts and in the 19th part 
was a series of illustrations. And um, he used this uh, particular part to publicize his forgeries. He would uh, come across these supposed rarities and uh, offer them to his friends and associates at a, a really inflated price, I think. He sold many of them to American collectors like John Quinn and John Henry Wren. We have a Ruskin forgery. In 1836, Ruskin went up to Oxford, still interested in poetry, tried three times to win the Newdigate Prize in poetry. First time he was defeated by a young man who eventually became the Dean of Westminster. Uh, second time he was defeated by a friend of his, but the third time he was successful. And here we have um, three versions of this Newdigate Prize poem um, called Salceda and Elephanta. Salceta and Elephanto were islands off the coast of India. Ruskin's poem is very descriptive of these islands, and he talks about early religious rituals that occurred on these islands. Um, a very florid type of uh, poem. He recited the poem in the Sheldonian Theater in Oxford on June 12, 1839. His father attended the occasion, but his mother was too nervous. Uh, remember, he had to recite this poem from memory as well, and it's uh, over 200 lines long. Uh, Wordsworth was on hand for this recitation. He was to receive an honorary degree there, and later on, Ruskin and his father were able to carry on quite a conversation with uh, Wordsworth, one of, one of Ruskin's heroes. So here on the left, we have a, a book called Oxford Prize Poems, uh, published in 1839. This is the ordinary edition of the uh, volume, in cloth with a paper label. On the right, we have uh, a uh, finely bound copy of the Oxford Prize Poems uh, containing illustrations. So there are two versions of this book. The pamphlet in the middle, uh, 19 pages long, I believe, uh, used to be considered the first edition. James Dearden in his article on these books, however, feels that probably the volume on the left would be the true first printing since the publisher probably obtained a copy of the poem as soon as it won the award, printed up sheets and printed this volume. Uh, the, the poem does not appear in the table of contents because it was added at the last minute, it's the last poem in the book. And after that, almost immediately after that, the uh, pamphlet form became available. Here we have a conglomeration of modern painters. I'll just run through them quickly for you um, and then talk about them in a little more detail. On the left here, we have a first edition, 1843, of Modern Painters. Uh, a second edition of Modern Painters in a publisher's presentation binding, second edition, 1844. Volume two, first edition, 1846. And then five volumes, which I purchased together. Um, this is the way you usually find these books if you're looking for a complete set. Uh, volume one here in this complete set is a fifth edition, volume two, second edition, volume three, third edition, the first edition rather, 1856, volume four, 1856, and volume five, 1860. It's difficult to collect um, a complete edition of uh, this book in first edition because you notice the difference in size between volume one and um, rest of the volumes. Also, they were published over a 17 year period, which uh, makes it difficult to put a set together.
find a volume of modern painters that are superiority in the art of landscape painting to the ancient masters. The lettering is enclosed by the device of two trees, a lake, and the setting sun. And the author in this book is listed only as a graduate of Oxford. Austin's name did not appear here. Uh, this uh, second edition of volume one here uh, in the presentation binding has an inscription on the inside with the author's most respectful, respectful compliments. I believe this is probably in the secretarial hand from the publisher, but inside is the plate of Sir Robert Peel, British Prime Minister. Um, when volume two was published, this one here, there was a notice inside that said, the illustrations preparing for the third volume of this work, having rendered a large paper necessary, the present volume and the third edition of the first volume in preparation are arranged in a corresponding form. So a larger page size was uh, desirable. And so volume one with uh, no advertisements, or no, no illustrations rather, now you get in volume three, four, and five, get some illustrations. It took me about 20 years to collect this complete set. I think I bought this set first, then came across a first edition of volume one, and a few years later, an edition of volume. One of the uh, things that is nice about buying certain books is that you get added bonuses. And in this particular book, someone over the years pasted in an autograph letter by Ruskin. You can see here the title page and uh, the Ruskin letter inserted there. There's a close up. Um, I'll read this letter to you quickly. It's addressed to uh, my dear Quarry. Quarry was a man named George Cortis Pine Talbot. So his uh, common name, I guess, was Quarry. So it's my dear Quarry. His mother was Fanny Talbot. She gave to the guild several cottages and some land in Barmouth, and throughout her life continued to support um, the Guild of St. George with uh, financial contributions. This is uh, Ruskin writing to her son. And he says, I think that you may as well say the paper merely, sign the paper merely as yourself, without any mention of trusteeship. And I will think if there's anybody else who could more conveniently take the office. He's writing here about uh, affairs of the Guild of St. George. He goes through, and uh, here is the second page of the letter. He mentions uh, in the letter, uh, starting about here, but I do not know if I pointed out to Mr. Baker that this paper must also be signed on the ninth page also. And if he and my Birmingham friends have not so signed, you must leave open for them to do so and return the paper to Belfield. Of Venice, we shall have plenty of time to speak. And uh, signs himself very briefly. George Baker uh, was the second master of the Guild of St. George, taking over from Oscar in 1900. He gave land uh, to, in the area now, which is called Ruskin land, several acres of land in that area. So a little bonus here, Ruskin letter. We come now to the seven lamps of architecture. Published in uh, 1849, this was the first major book to bear the name of John Ruskin on the title page. The book contained 14 plates, all etched by Ruskin himself, 
It's the only addition to bear these etched plates. The plates in the second edition were uh, re-etched. So this is a very desirable addition to possess. It was issued in embossed and designed cloth boards of a deep claret color. Now they tend to be sort of a brownish color. Uh, in a note in the book, uh, Ruskin writes, on the cover of this volume, the reader will find some figure outlines of the same period and character from the floor of San Miniato at Florence. I have to thank its designer, Mr. W. Harry Rogers, for his intelligent arrangement of these and graceful adaptation of them uh, of the connecting arabesques. And within the circles, we see uh, the seven lamps, religio, observantia, autoritas, fides, obedientia, memoria, and spiritus. And um, now, as um, they used to say on Monty Python, if you're familiar with Monty Python, now for something completely different. We have uh, Ruskin's fairy tale, The King of the Golden River, published in 1851. It appears here in the original glazed boards. And the advertisement on the inside, a little note says, the King of the Golden River was written in 1841 at the request of a very young lady and solely for her amusement without any idea of publication. It has been published with the passive assent of the author. So Ruskin finally agreed to publish this. Uh, the young lady happened to be Effie Gray, Ruskin's future wife. And here's the title page and the frontispiece of the book. On the left, we have a figure called the Southwest Wind Esquire. He's a very interesting figure. Uh, apparently, in the, after the third edition, or in the third edition of this book, this um, rather unusual nose, in the shape of a horn, uh, was removed. Apparently, it uh, tended to frighten small children when they having the book read to them. So the publisher uh, re-engraved the plate or changed the plate so that uh, this would disappear. Another little bibliographical note down here, uh, a legend of Styria. Uh, on the first page, or, uh, cover of the book rather, you barely see the word Styria here, a legend of Styria, but it's spelled with an I. It's also spelled with an I on the title page, the printed title page of the book. But here is a very strange eye compared to this eye here. This one is kind of warped. And apparently when the plate was engraved, before they uh, realized it, uh, they found out that this was a mistake. It was S-T-Y-R-I-A here. Major mistake on the title page. So the plate was changed and the arm of the Y going out here is removed. This is a book which a collector would like to have in the original boards because the decorations on the front board and the back board are not reproduced anywhere else. Stones of Venice. This is a book that is a little bit easier to collect in the first edition. This volume one was published in 1851. Volumes two and three were published in 1853, so you don't have this extended long time period. On the front cover is a blind stamped frame enclosing a design in gilt based on a sculpture used in St. Mark's. The peacock is the symbol of the resurrection. On the spine at the top is a representation of the lion of St. Mark's. So a very beautiful binding edition of the Stones of Venice. Here we have uh, a little pamphlet which reproduces uh, a chapter from the Stones of Venice on the nature of Gothic. In uh, the first edition of the book it was called The Nature of Gothic. 
This humble volume of 50 pages owes its origin to Dr. Frederick J. Furnival, one of the founders of the Working Men's College in London. Ruskin had offered to teach art at the college, and Furnival wrote, I felt that we wanted some printed thing to introduce us to the working men of London. Ruskin and his publisher, Smith Elder, agreed to the reprinting of chapter two of the Stones of Venice. Furnival added to the title the following, and you can see it here. Uh, and herein of the true functions of the workmen in art show how the chapter would have some sort of relevance to these working men that uh, would be coming to the classes at the Working Men's College. We wanted something that a little more tangible that they could give to each uh, man. The pamphlet was given to every man who attended the opening session of the Working Men's College and was well received. Here we have a second edition of the pamphlet. It was reprinted with a folding woodcut of the Doge's Palace in Venice and sold at sixpence to help support the college. It's a very small volume um, and, uh, and very fragile and not in the best of condition, as you can see. So we go from this very humble volume of, on the nature of Gothic to a very different type of book. Here we have William Morris's edition of On the Nature of Gothic, finely produced book. Morris was interested in producing books which harkened back to the uh, books of the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries, and both manuscript and printed. Uh, this copy is bound in vellum with uh, a gilt lettering on the spine, The Nature of Gothic by John Ruskin, and it has ties. Uh, if, if you've handled any books bound in vellum, the covers tend to bow out, they, they bend a little bit, they warp. So this would be a way of tying the book together. It would fit on your shelves a little bit better. And this is how the nature of the Gothic appears in the Kelmscott Press edition by William Morris. And in the preface, uh, Morris wrote, to my mind, and I believe to some others, it is one of the most important things uh, written by the author, and in future days will be considered as one of the very few necessary and inevitable utterances of the century. To some of us, when we first read it, now many years ago, it seemed to point out a new road on which the world should uh, travel. So this is William Morris's homage to his master, John Ruskin, and uh, very beautifully produced book, fine paper, fine print, designed for these books, and beautiful embellishments on the side. Still staying a little bit with uh, the Stones of Venice, we have here a book called Examples of the Architecture of Venice. Notice my little 12 inch ru ruler there. This is probably the largest book that I own in terms of size. At the end of volume one of the Stones of Venice is a prospectus for this work. And it says, Mr. Ruskin has found it impossible to reduce to the size of the octavo volume all the sketches made to illustrate his intended essay on Venetian architecture, at least without loss of accuracy and detail. And so Ruskin decided to publish a series of pamphlets, large pamphlets with illustrations, which would show the buildings more clearly and allow people to look at these and um, read Stones of Venice with more understanding. Here are a couple plates from this book. Again, look at the 12 inch ruler and see how large these plates are. If uh, you have any familiarity, however, with uh, Ruskin drawings, know that uh, many, many of his drawings are not complete drawings. That is complete drawings of buildings, complete drawings of animals or complete drawings of landscapes. They often show only what Ruskin is interested in at that particular moment, whether it's an archway 
capital feather of a bird. Uh, and these plates are of a similar note. Ruskin actually warns prospective buyers of these volumes. He says, in order to prevent future disappointment, Mr. Ruskin wishes it to be observed that very few of the drawings will be of entire buildings. The chief value of the plates will be their almost servile veracity, a merit which will be appreciated when the buildings themselves are no more and they perish daily. So Ruskin made some of these drawings to, uh, as uh, a memory aid for what the buildings looked like. Peter Potter in his lecture on photography mentioned how Ruskin used these uh, photographs of daguerreotypes to accomplish the same sort of thing. They were originally intended to be 12 parts with each part containing five plates. However, only three parts were ever issued. And uh, this, uh, the book that I showed you happened to be a second edition. I haven't been able to find a first edition that I could afford yet. Unto this last, four essays on the first principle <clears throat> of political economy. Ruskin now turned his attention in 1860 to, uh, this was published in 1862, uh, turned his attention to theories of national wealth and social justice. A series of essays were first published in the new Cornhill magazine, edited by William Makepeace Thackeray. The essays were received by the critics with hysteria. They were referred to as intolerable twaddle. Uh, another person called Ruskin, uh, the author was um, referred to as a perfect paragon of blubbering. The essays were stopped by the publisher Smith Elder after the fourth was published uh, as being tainted by, quote, socialistic heresy. And so Ruskin then published the essays in book form. This particular book contains a book plate. It's the book, book plate of H.D. and E. Ronsley. Um, Hardwick Drummond Ronsley and his wife were followers of Ruskin, followers of, of his ideas, avid readers. Ronsley was born in 1851 and died in 1920. He and his wife Edith formed the Keswick School of Industrial Arts. Ronsley, with Robert Hunter and Octavia Hill, founded the National Trust for Places of Historical Interest or Natural Beauty. Ronsley was a clergyman who had served for many years in the Lake District. He wrote a hymn, which was sung at Ruskin's funeral service, and he published many books about the Lake District one of which was entitled Ruskin and the English Lakes. So th this is one of my favorite uh, association copies with this uh, particular person. Come now quickly, I'm trying to hurry up a little bit here because time is uh, fleeting. I'll come now to Forrest Clavagera published from 1871 to 1884. It was published in 96 parts, which Ruskin called Letters uh, to the Workmen and Laborers of Great Britain. We might call these letters today Ruskin's blog. It contains his thoughts on all manner of topics, whatever concerned him at the time of writing, his ideas on current events, his reactions to the correspondence sent to him for which he asked, generated by the letters. And um, I have here the uh, pamphlets for the year 1877. And the pamphlet here is opened to a very significant passage. Um, Ruskin was writing about uh, a current exhibition at the Grosvenor Gallery in London. And one of the pictures in the Grosvenor Gallery was this picture called Nocturne in Black and Gold Falling Rocket by Whistler, James McGill Whistler. And um, 
go back to the pamphlet for a second. See here, this is a passage which got Ruskin into a great deal of trouble. Uh, after extolling the virtues of a painter like Edward Byrne Jones, and he talks about Byrne Jones, I know that these pictures will be immortal as the best things the mid 19th century in England could do. He then turns to Whistler. Start reading uh, the book right here. See the cursor? For Mr. Whistler's own sake, no less than for the protection of the purchaser, Sir Coots Lindsay ought not to have admitted works into the gallery in which the ill-educated conceit of the artist so nearly approached the aspect of willful imposture. I have seen and heard much of cockney impudence before now, but never expected to hear a coxcomb ask 200 guineas for flinging a pot of paint in the public space. And uh, this is again, Whistler's picture. Uh, he was understandably upset. He sued Ruskin. And um, during the cross-examination in the trial, which unfortunately Ruskin wasn't able to attend because he had become ill uh, with one of his attacks of what was then called brain fever. So he wasn't there. But the cross-examiner said, uh, the labor of two days is that for which you ask 200 guineas? And Whistler replied, no, I ask it for the knowledge I have gained in the work of a lifetime. And Whistler won the case, received a farthing and went bankrupt. Here we have Ruskin's autobiography by Terata. It was issued in 28 parts from 1885 to 1889. The July 1889 part was the last piece that uh, Ruskin wrote for publication himself. Uh, it was published in small paper copies. These happen to be large paper copies. So they are with wide margins. Uh, they're beautiful books. Uh, he was encouraged to uh, write his autobiography by his American friend, Charles Eliot Norton. There were uh, autobiographical chapters already published in Flores Caballera, and some of these were included in Praeterita. The book is fragmentary and selective, and uh, in the topics which are included. Ruskin wrote about the topics that he was most interested in and uh, wanted to write about not necessarily ones which uh, we would have liked him to write about. Uh, in the early 1880s, Ruskin met uh, Reverend John Fonthorpe, who was the principal of Whitelands College in London, which was a teacher training college for young female teachers. And Two of them got together and discussed certain things, and they came up with the idea of having a May Queen Festival. Every year, uh, around the beginning of May, they would have this May Queen Festival. Now, the college still exists today, Whitelands College. It's a part of the University of Roehampton in London. Uh, the uh, festival still exists today, every year. However, it's now called the May Monarch Festival, because the college now includes young men as students as well. So it, uh, they, they changed the name. But uh, in the May Queen Festival, uh, the May Queen was chosen by some of the other students, some of her colleagues. Ruskin tended to hate competitions. He felt uh, he didn't like competitions where somebody won and somebody lost. But in this particular uh, situation. He said that um, the, the uh, competition, or not, not really the competition, but the event should be the recognition of an uncontending worth. 
So it doesn't have to do with academic achievement, but some uncontending worth, which tended to be the character of the person involved. So the May Queen was crowned. She received several volumes of Ruskin's works, and she was then supposed to award uh, a volume to uh, each of her compatriots that she felt deserved it. So uh, the book that uh, you saw here was uh, volume three of Forrest Clavigera. You open it up and here is the book label for the Ruskin May Queen Festival, 1886. This is the second festival. The first one was 1885. It's uh, a prize, a book awarded to Dora Qualtrough, and she received the prize for she is bold in heart and task and word. Not because she's an excellent student necessarily, although she may have been, but this is why she received it. Here is Fonthorpe's signature, the principal, John Ruskin, also signs each of the book plates. And down below here we have uh, May Queen, I forget exactly, I think it's Elizabeth. Elizabeth Blowfield is the May Queen, and this is her picture. Here's a, a volume which was a, I was able to buy within the past few months. It's another presentation volume, Whitelands College, the May Queen, 1903. Here is the book label. Uh, and the prize is awarded to, and fortunately, somebody has rubbed out the name of the person who received this. And it would be the May Queen who received this book. The uh, staff at Whitelands College is very helpful. I've, I've written them several times asking for information on the books that I've received here. And they wrote back and said, well, 1903, May Queen is Muriel Pierce. Here is Muriel Pierce in her full regalia. And she received this book, which is the Queen of the Air. Yes. And uh, Gemma Bentley, the lady who wrote to me from Whitelands College, believes that perhaps this is the book. She's holding the book, that may be holding the book that she received when she was crowned May Queen. That's the book. have to go through quickly here a few of the Roycroft items. Uh, Alan did a wonderful job last week of uh, dealing with uh, Roycroft and Roycroft publications. Here's the Little Journeys book. The, again, the humble little, little Journeys book found in brown. Little Journeys to the home of great genius, and it's John Ruskin. But as Alan pointed out, the Roycroft Press also produced many other books which were much more elaborate. Here is one, Ruskin and Turner, the title page, with an illustration printed in red and black. The book was limited to 473 copies. Each copy is signed and numbered, and this book is number 417, so says Albert Hubbard as he signs it. As Alan pointed out last week, many of these books contain illuminated pages. This illuminated page. Here's the uh, collected works of John Ruskin, the 39 volume edition by Cook and Wedderburn. A monumental task uh, and a beautiful set. Incidentally, down here, here is a run of St. George, the uh, publication of the Birmingham uh, Ruskin Society. And I'd like to end with uh, two items here. Uh, one is a picture on the left of John Ruskin and his old friend, Sir Henry Ackland. Henry Ackland had been his friend from college days. Uh, he was the Regius Professor of Medicine at Oxford. Um, a fact for our American listeners, he accompanied the Prince of Wales in 1860 as the Prince's doctor 
when the Prince came to North America and uh, visited the US and Canada. This picture was taken on August 1st, um, 1893 in the garden at Brantwood by Sarah Angelina Ackland, Henry Ackland's daughter and a noted photographer. Now we know that Ruskin was incapacitated many times uh, during the last 10, 10 years of his life. Here's a piece of note paper that came with a covering letter from a secretary saying that Mr. Ruskin would be happy to send his autograph. So here is Ruskin, must be one of the last autographs which he ever gave. And I can imagine the time and effort he expended at his advanced age and advanced mental capacity to write simply, faithfully yours, John Ruskin, March 1896. And uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening and looking at these books. Thank you, Bob. Very You're welcome. Interesting, very interesting. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions. Uh, first question up, how long have you been collecting and what inspired you to collect Ruskin? Good. Well, I've been uh, collecting, I think that little book of, uh, the, the political economy of art I bought in 1968. So that tells you how long I've been collecting. Uh, and uh, I was listening to a lecture in a third year university course at the University of Western Ontario, London, Ontario. Professor Earl Sanborn who was an American, I believe. And he talked about Ruskin. And I think we used the Riverside edition of Ruskin. I don't know whether any of you, if you took English courses, at university use the Riverside editions of poets and novelists. Uh, the Ruskin one happened to be brown, I think, and it had selections of Ruskin. And I think that we were probably reading Unto This Last or uh, On the Nature of Gothic. Probably. I was attracted to Ruskin's ideas. Uh, Professor Sanborn also said that he had managed to get a copy of the library edition or the University of Western Ontario Library. And uh, unbelievably, it didn't have one at that time. He said it was difficult to get the authorities to expend the money. But he was successful. After the lecture, I went up to the library and took a look at the library edition. And uh, that sort of started me off. Bob, I have a question. And it is about Thomas Wise. You probably know about this more than I do, but he is famed, as you said, for being a um, uh, someone who made facsimiles of Ruskin editions, claimed that they were other than they were, et cetera. Can you tell us a little bit about, about the wise uh, fakes and, and the scandals surrounding that? Well, he published uh, many uh, Ruskin fakes. Um, I, I think that the Psychologists have tried to figure out why a man with this wonderful library, one of the best, if not the best in England for English literature, would uh, try to try to do forgeries. But it, it just wasn't enough. Um, you would, uh, trying to think of other things that we can talk about. The, the main book, the first book was called, uh, uh, that exposed him in 1934. He was exposed, by the way, during his lifetime. So he had to suffer that. It's called an inquiry into the into 19, certain 19th century pamphlets by John Carter and Graham Pollard. There are many modern books too on uh, uh, Thomas James Wise as well. But uh, he would uh, go and visit, for instance, Swinburne was still alive. He would go to the Pines to visit Swinburne and Swinburne's caretaker, Theodore Watts Dunton. Uh, he would be able to obtain manuscripts, uh, and then he would miraculously produce, it was a poetical manuscript, let's say, he would miraculously produce uh, a couple of uh, copies of this. Um, and then he would have one for himself, and he would offer one to, let's say, John Quinn or, uh, or Wren in the United States at a, at a big price. And so you 
to obtain a rarity for your library, he did publish quite a few um, editions of, of Ruskin letters as well. Um, these tend to be, uh, there was some limitation in the number of copies printed with these. There's a whole series. Uh, often it said limited to 33 copies and a number of copies printed on vellum. Uh, but do we trust Thomas J. Wise to only produce 33 copies when you might be able to flog 100 or 150? I do have one copy of uh, one of these books, Letters to um, William Ward, I believe it is. And it's a presentation copy from Thomas Wise to uh, Edmund Goss, 19th century literary critic. He has quite a storied career. And uh, I, I think if you like detective stories too, uh, it's uh, interesting to read about him. The forgeries, one of the main things that they used in detecting the forgeries was, for instance, the Leone. If it were published in 1868, the paper would be rag paper probably. However, it was published on in some sort of chemical paper, which was only manufactured maybe in the 1880s, 1890s. So chemical analysis and science did Thomas J. Wise in. Bob, we have a couple more questions here. Have you published articles about your collection at all? No, I haven't. I'm not a great person to write, so no, I haven't. Okay. Uh, how do you preserve your most fragile Ruskin treasures? <laughs> well, I probably don't preserve them as well as I should. Um, some of the letters, I have quite a few Ruskin autograph letters. They're in a safety deposit box, and I work from, from those scans. I, I get the scan out and look at them, but most of them are in the uh, safety deposit box. I guess I just try to keep the house uh, climate controlled. Um, the, the books are in a room. In my previous house, they were in a room when you pulled the curtains, it was absolutely pitch black. Uh, the house I'm in now, they aren't quite so uh, well protected from the sun, but there are uh, uh, blinds there and uh, they're also nice and dry. You want to keep your books dry. How do you go about finding your treasures? Do, are you looking at, do you have specific dealers you go to, auctions, other collectors, online? Right, right. The, um, first of all, I, I would use catalogs in the old days. Sometimes two or three catalogs might appear in the mail on a certain day. That would be a wonderful day. And then you would comb through those catalogs. Now I use the internet. Thank goodness. Um, the ABE books mainly is what I, what I use. And I go on every day to check the recent additions uh, to the site. Uh, dealers have played a big part also in my um, collecting over the years. That big uh, 39 volume edition of uh, Ruskin's works, the library edition, I bought from Corich, London. They shipped that book across the ocean in three great big postal bags, all wrapped up very carefully. And I didn't have to pay a cent until it arrived. Very trusted. Uh, another book firm that uh, unfortunately no longer exists, Ian Hodgkins and Company were instrumental. Uh, there's a dealer in Canada named Robert Wright, who specializes in uh, Ruskin material and pre-Raphaelite material. Uh, I've um, bought from him. I've established some good relationships with dealers over the years. Dealers are wonderful people uh, and they go the uh, extra mile for it. I appreciate them. Are there, many are there many collectors focused on Ruskin? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know how many. I believe one of us is uh, here today. I see his picture, Mr. Benjamin. <laughs> he has a, I, I've never met uh, Mr. Benjamin, unfortunately, I'd like to. Uh, he has a wonderful collection. I don't know whether, do you want to talk about your collection? Right? Dyke, do you want to unmute yourself? I'm, I'm trying to find the mute. Uh, gotcha. It's already been done. Okay. Well, 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Knight, for a very uh, illuminating lecture. Um, I have spent a good portion of my adult life collecting, but now my treasures are largely at the Houghton Library at Harvard. Uh, I gave my uh, collection to Harvard to add to their collection. It was uh, a nice place for the collection to find a new home because of Ruskin's relationships with Charles Eliot Norton uh, and Francesca Alexander and um, other uh, American sources as well as his uh, UK and uh, Italian uh, sources. So uh, you're all welcome once the Houghton reopens, it's now being remodeled go up and uh, look at the uh, Ruskin treasures. There is a catalog that went with it. And uh, I, I found that uh, uh, while I miss a lot of my books, that I still have a number of Ruskin books because as you know, the libraries only want the manuscripts and the letters and uh, the inscribed copies and so on. And so I have a lot of reference books and so on that I'm still enjoying. So I, I think that um, uh, it hasn't really stopped in terms of my, my collecting and certainly my interest in Ruskin um, goes on. I'd like to ask you, sir, uh, to what extent has your Ruskin adventure influenced your life and uh, been an integral part of it? Well, I think uh, reading Ruskin's ideas makes you a better person. If you, uh, try to follow his, his beliefs that, uh, for instance, every single person is important. And to be kind to people, to do anything that you can to help them, to uh, in some ways take the focus off yourself and onto what is needed in society around you. So I think it's maybe a better person in that way. Uh Folks, before we sign off on, on this lecture, thanks, Bob. It was great. It's lovely to see all those those wonderful things that you have. And um, there's uh, some images I thought were terrific. Huh? I'll talk to you about that later. But if anybody's interested in in collecting Ruskin, um, Bob uh, Bob knows all the sources as well. I I did want to mention to people there's a site that is just terrific. I've used it for years. It's called adall.com, A-D-D-A-L-L.com, simple. But it's essentially a, 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 book search, a, a, a book search engine that searches almost all the major sites in the US, the UK, Australia, for anything you want. So they have a used book tab, and you go on to adall.com, you click on the used book tab, and you put in, let's say, uh, the political economy of art by Ruskin. And they will find, if it's out there, they will find it. They will give you comparisons between the different editions that are available. If you're interested in a particular edition, they give you a way to connect with the publisher, sorry, the, 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 the bookseller, so that you can ask a particular question. They will send you pictures of the book if you want it. I found it a terrific site, so I highly recommend it. Bob uses A Books. I like A Books as well, but they are also searched by adall.com. So if a books has it, then that'll show up. But there are many other sellers. This is a world thing now where, and I bought, I bought Ruskin stuff out of Australia. So, so it's, uh, I'm highly recommend it if you're interested, even if you're interested in somebody other than Ruskin, you know, you have another particular love, let's say Thackeray or somebody, you can use it at all.com, use books tab. It's really, really useful. And I might add too that uh, quickly that uh, unless you're going after really scarce Ruskin first editions, older editions of Ruskin are quite affordable. That's right. I'd like to read Ruskin in an older book. Great. Well, Bob, thank you once again. You're welcome. I'm going to end uh, your talk right now.